Welcome back to the Weekend Ball Podcast, your bod- podcast for all things Canada basketball. We will be following the Canadian men's basketball team and their journey throughout the FIBA World Cup and their quest to qualify for the Olympics. I'm really, really excited to be joined by Will Liu of Sportsnet, host of the Raptors show that everyone should check out uh, for all things Raptors and a bit of Canadian basketball content these these days as well. Um, how's it going, Will? And, and thanks so much for, for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Those are uh, that's a uh, very nice of you to to recommend the show, and um, yeah, no, you're you're having you're having like the the work trip I've always really wanted, which was to to go to <laughs> Asia to cover uh, basketball. So I'm, I'm I'm quite jealous, but I'm also very happy for for you and all the other Canadian reporters out there getting to cover this event. What well, well, what would you have done if you uh, were if Sportsnet said you could have gone to China in 2019? Uh, man. Well, first off, I wasn't working at Sportsnet. But, I know that. Uh, I know. know. Yeah. <laughs> but no but i mean uh yeah i, I would have been thrilled i mean i think the only thing with then was was it maybe during pandemic was it not pandemic no it was before it was, before it was pre-pandemic the oh man i would have loved it man well i mean i would have definitely gone covered the event uh Were... just covered the whole world cup and then i think afterwards i probably would have just went to visit family and traveled around a little bit but yeah taking a free Where... trip kind of thing where's your uh, family in in china is it kind of all over or specific places or uh, it, it's a little bit all over, but I would say my my hometown is it's in the north, like um, it, it's in a city called Tianjin. It's a uh, okay, kind of yeah. right beside Beijing. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. Anyways, well, I want to get kind of started with this a little bit, and for you, well, obviously you've such a big Raptors fan now, covering the team for a long time. But for, when were you first introduced to the Canadian men's basketball team? That's a good question. Um. You know, funnily enough, I think my first like strong memory of um watching Canada basketball was probably around the time that they lost to Venezuela. I remember being like in university at a bar. Um I didn't have cable at home. Um so went to a bar with a friend um who was working with Canada basketball at that time as an intern. We were both at the school newspaper together hmm. and um yeah, so he was like, "Yeah, let's let's go to the bar to watch Canada basketball." I'm like, "Yeah, I'm down." <clears throat> and I just remember, yeah, being in a bar in Hamilton and, and watching Canada lose that game against <laughs> Venezuela. So <laughs> that's like my first, like, yeah, strong memory of watching Canada basketball. Unfortunately, but yeah, okay, yeah, let's just hope uh, it's not like that uh, kind of in this tournament. But we'll see. But yeah, that's yeah. a that's definitely a fond memory for me. It's the same, maybe not that direct game. I, I remember following them and and seeing all the NBAers and then. Mm-hmm. That stupid call on yeah. Anyways, that and yeah, then twenty twenty one and uh, it's 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 been a fun ride. At least for you, Will, you have the Raptors championship that no one can ever take away from you. So you're 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 set for life. But um, Wait, do we not all have that? Are you not a Raptor? Fan? I am. I am. No, no, oh, okay, I am too. Yeah. I, no, we, we I, I remember. I, I actually I remember the Kawhi shot. I jumped up and hit my head on the ceiling because uh, in my basement. That's so it. that the, yeah yeah. So I mean, I am a taller guy, so maybe it's just. I, I I say I have credit card hops because I get that high off the ground, but uh, just like uh, millimeters. But uh, yeah, um, for, just for you, will like how kind of how how would you assess this team kind of going through the exhibition games and and what what do you think what I like just what what are your initial thoughts on on the team so far and and any standouts anything that maybe you're a bit worried about but just just your initial thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I mean. Look, I, I'm pretty encouraged. My expectation for this tournament for for Canada is to, um, obviously try to secure an Olympic berth, and, um, you know, but at the same time, I didn't have any delusions in terms of just Canada being able to like steamroll the competition. I just never thought that that was going to be the case. We are not Team USA, and we don't have that caliber of NBA players. Um, but at the same time, the fact that they play Germany so competitively over the balance of two games and and beating them in overtime uh, and then following that up with beating Spain. I mean, like those are two of the at worst, like two of the top eight teams in the world. Right. Um, Germany has really come on strong. Shout out to Dennis Schroeder. He's been excellent. Um, you know, I'm excited to see Well, it's, it's built up more excitement to, for me to see him <laughs> with the Raptors. Let's let's say that. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah. And then Spain is Spain, you know, like I've, you know, having watched a, a lot of you know these uh, international basketball competitions, I remember even watching like um, Eurobasket. That was one of my first like assignments over Raptors Republic was just like mm. I'm gonna watch all of Lithuania's games for Eurobasket. 
for JV. And so like, yeah, for JV. And it was, I think like back in 2013. And so like, you know, obviously if you watch any European basketball, any international basketball, like Spain literally finishes top four of every tournament for like literally going back to 20 or 2000, I think. So wow. like, this is a really formidable opponent. And so for Canada to go in there and to, I would say have more talent, but also play cohesively enough to, to get some results was really impressive to me. So, I mean, for me, the standout um, has been RJ. I mean, I mean, I don't know what I was expecting from RJ. Um, I think maybe it's just because you see these players so much in an NBA context. Mm -hmm. And RJ Barrett in an NBA context might feel like a little bit disappointing, maybe a little bit polarizing. You know, he's not necessarily the ideal third option that I think the Knicks need from him. But at the same time, you see the potential, you see the ability I mean, in this Team Canada setting, I think he's done a really, really great job of um, making plays, being decisive, not over dribbling. He's hitting threes at a pretty good clip right now, and he continues to get downhill and, and finish strong at the basket. And I I, I know that Shea is going to have um, his way because, you know, he's just so talented. He's by far our most talented player. And, um, you know, he's had a little bit ups and downs too, but I think he's grown more confident as the warm-ups games went. But um rj has sort of been there steadily obviously that game in germany um he had like what he won like thir 12 or 13 or 13 or 13 14, 14 floor. Yeah. yeah yeah and he had like four or five like key baskets down the stretch in the fourth quarter and in overtime like he has just been really impressive to me and yeah if he steps up that secondary option along with kelly olenek then all of a sudden i feel really really confident about canada's ability to to to, to score now i actually think that their first matchup against france that's going to be really tough for rj just because I think they have some specific matchups that might take away what he does well. But at the same time, um, yeah, he's been the guy that's really, you know, stood out to me. Do you, do you think just on that, because like today I asked him about just like how his game translates to FIBA and he said the paint's wide open. Like, do you think RG's just the overall better player in a FIBA context? Yeah, I was having this discussion too yesterday um, on my program and I was like, you know, thinking about so one of my guests, Lee Ban, um, he talked about that RJ in the NBA typically doesn't have the athleticism advantage. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously a very athletic guy, very strong too, which I think for a wing, especially a younger player, um, he's able to use his strength really well and play bully ball. But at the same time, at the NBA level, like a lot of teams are like the Raptors, like Vision Six Nine, like there's just mm -hmm. you know he doesn't necessarily have that kind of advantage but in this FIBA setting especially with teams committing their best defenders trying to stop art um stop uh Shea sure. like he's been able to use his size well and I also think that part of it may be just like maybe poor scouting reports or even preparation like I think the number one thing in a scouting report for RJ you know if you were to steal a scouting report from the Knicks uh which I wouldn't <laughs> imagine anybody doing um <laughs> would be uh you, you you keep him from driving left and take away his left hand right because he's so left hand dominant but he's been able to get to his left hand repeatedly going downhill. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think he has the size advantage more in this kind of competition. But I also think that, like, it's it's also a product of playing with Shea in a way. I think that, like, defenses mm -hmm. are so trying to take away that pick-and-roll game, try that one-on-one -on -one game that Shea does and committing extra defenders. And when the ball swings over to RJ, he's been able to make a really decisive move. And, you know, everyone talks about the FIBA officiating, and it is more inconsistent. Um, sometimes I would say overall it's like a tighter whistle it feels like but uh, at the same or like a looser whistle in the sense that like you know the more contacts being allowed but mm -hmm. I feel like RJ has been consistently playing through the contact and I like that aspect of his game as well and with that just to go back to Shea a little bit like do you think it's almost the opposite between those two players in terms of maybe the NBA makes or allows Shea to be his best self while the FIBA game is a bit harder for him or, or do you think he's adapted well so far, I mean, he hasn't been bad by any means, but mm -hmm. is it a bit harder for him to score? Maybe harder for him to draw fouls like he does in the NBA? Like, what do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, so much of RJ's game is predicated on driving, right? So I think that, um, A, the court is a little bit smaller for him um, with the arc being closer. Um, I also think that, like, for him, yeah, it has been a bit of an adjustment period because he takes a lot of contact every time he drives. And... Um, you know, I, I wouldn't even say he's foul baiting. Like, it's, it's, it's not like a James Harden situation. No, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I mean, at the same time, I, f I always feel like Shea is able to get a step on the guy and then get him on his hip and then drive and stretch. And obviously, he's great finishing with either hand. He's also missed a couple of layups here or there. You, you see some of the frustration kind of come through in the exhibition games. But, 
yeah, I think for him, it's just like adjusting to the fact that those are not guaranteed calls. And so you have to always play for the finish. And that's where I thought, especially in the in game against Spain, I thought he did really, really well, mm-hmm. both getting to his spots, getting to his shot, but also drawing the contact, like a several and ones. I feel like that's always a good sign of what Shea should be doing because he is a guy who is shifty, gets to his matchups. And then, of course, at that point, it's just like, is his jumper working or not? Um, obviously, we're not going to expect lots of like three point shooting from Shea necessarily, but um, is that mid range jumper working? Because if that's working as well, then that really opens up the rest of his drives. But um, I think he's gotten stronger as the tournament went on. He he definitely started slow that first game against Germany. Um, but yeah, so if you take that out, that, that one game out, I feel like he's he's done well. How how worried are you about kind of maybe Canada's lack of size in, in this tournament? Obviously. FIBA is a different game. Size can really matter. Um, just what what do you make of that? And and maybe just not really having a a, a normal five man like Powell's just undersized and, and and especially at the backup as well. Yeah, it's definitely a concern of mine. Um, I mean, I think if if you think about Canada's talent in basketball, like across the board, like that is clearly the one area that's that's lagging. Um, we have lots of great wings. We have lots of great guards. Um, you know, but we just don't have that kind of selection as at bigs. I would say even if we got our best bigs all available all at once, it's still a weakness of the team. And I think in, in particular to this team, you know, I appreciate things that Dwight Powell brings, you know, um, there's the versatility and, and the ability to switch, even though they're not switching too, too much, uh, at least at the five. But, um, you know, there is the switchability there. He definitely tries to play physical. He pretty unselfish really like he does sacrifice for the team really well like for the starting unit the offense has basically just been um Shea who's directing and playing a lot of one-on-one RJ who's playing off the catch but also occasionally playing one-on-one and then Kelly who's should be one of the hubs because he's so good offensively especially in the FIBA game um that leaves Dwight Powell to like really sacrifice and that leaves Dylan Brooks to really sacrifice but at the same time like yeah I mean he's undersized like he's like six foot seven you know and yes. um I just don't feel like there's that same like lane intimidation, especially on defense, um, that I think I would like to see from from a guy in that position. So, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I'm curious just in terms of just like um, how Jordy is going to manage that because it's not like the backup options are too exceptional. I, I I like Kyle Alexander. I feel like he's been pretty solid throughout, and um, I, I trust him. But at the same time, I I trust him in, in a bench context if he has to go up against or play like a significant role. I'm, I'm not totally sure what that brings to Canada. And um, yeah, I mean, it even gets to the point for me where I'm like, I actually don't mind seeing some of these Kelly Olenek at five lineups just to get more of an advantage, play faster <clears throat> and have more shooting on the floor. So um, yeah, I'm definitely worried about Dwight Powell. And I think I'm also like a little bit scarred based on the qualifiers in Victoria where um, I forget who it was. Uh, oh, it was, uh andres balvins some he was like a seven foot two guy kind of looked like Zadrunas agauskas in the body and and and, and uh yeah he was just destroying um can't wait well he had like 19 rebounds yeah and dwight powell fouled well fouled out of that game i think yeah no i mean like that's kind of I, when you you mentioned fouled out i just think of him in foul trouble and in victoria against czech chia and i for, do you remember the guy who just made all those threes for for Blake Schlib, yeah, or Schilb, or some, Schilb, some one of yeah. those. Yeah, I remember Blake Murphy yeah. always talking about him and and just you know <laughs> coming up in my dreams in my nightmares. Sorry, but uh, with with that, like, do you think like I I know uh, you talked to you know friend of the show Jonathan Chen a little bit about Zach Eady, obviously um, the the Chinese connection, but like what what role does he have on this team? Like, obviously, I think he'll probably be on the twelve man roster. We'll find out um tomorrow but um Mm -hmm. would he have a place to kind of play significant minutes or in a bench role for this team especially against maybe a team like france with a guy like gobert and a lot of bigs yeah i mean look i i think we all knew like where zach ed could be a little bit weaker um and it's sort of the um not even inability to move his feet i don't think he's like super Mm -hmm. heavy on his feet for a guy of that size um but it's just like the the quickness and the burst i think is just a little bit lacking sometimes and so you'll see some possessions where i know like in that game where they beat germany ed came in and as soon as he came in dennis schroeder was like all right i'm gonna try you know try to isolate against this guy 
And I don't know whether it was a pick and roll or whether it was a switch, but essentially Schroeder got one on one against him and immediately turned the corner and got an and one. Now, of course, like Dennis Schroeder is like probably the fastest player in the tournament, right? So or the mm-hmm. quickest player in the tournament. So like that could happen to anybody. Um, the next play down, it was like Daniel Tice got him with an up fake and then drove yeah. around him for a basket. Or even against Spain, there was some, I don't know, if one of the more anonymous guards, I would say, for Spain. Um was able to drive straight at him turn the corner and go to the basket. And so I think it's just a, really a matter of like, how much can you play defensively and keep him in the paint where he doesn't necessarily need to take more than one step closer to the perimeter than he needs to, because that turn and recover and then burst at the basket does you know, even if you get beat, if you have the size advantage, you're, if you're able to turn and then, you know, have some athleticism to, jump up mm-hmm. and contest a shot and change the shot that's okay like i'm not expecting him to like be as quick as guards that'd be ridiculous uh but at the same time like yeah i i, I do think that defensively there has been a concern offensively i think obviously he's great i mean like he just mashes guys down low which i think for canada just they don't have anybody else who can do that in the front court mm-hmm. like dwight powell can catch a nice lob from kelly olenek and you know kyle alexander has been finishing decently but he's kind of your standard big um Edie definitely is able to like take up so much space and I think he's done a good job on the boards as well. But uh, I think you just got to find ways to manage with him defensively. And yeah, I mean, I I think even playing drop is not even enough. I think it has to be like a deep drop. Like it can't be Mm -hmm. him coming out like even above the free throw line kind of thing. Like your typical drop, I would suppose it's like your big is like maybe slightly below the free throw line. Like I need him almost in the restricted area. Um, Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, specific matchups I can definitely see, um, especially teams without, like, super great shooting guards. Um, but I feel like in an international context, like, I'm I'm scared of all the guards shooting. Like, it feels like the, the yeah. shooting across the board is very high, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. no, 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 for sure. I mean, I also think about just zone. I, I know they threw a couple of, of zones just with Edie, but we'll see, like, we'll, we'll definitely see. What have you noticed just with Jordy Fernandez and, and maybe what differences you see in the way Canada played uh, plays under him compared to Nick Nurse, who obviously you you know well of of covering him for for so long for Canada and uh, the Raptors. Yeah, um, I mean, I think first and foremost, like uh, it's been impressive to see Jordy earn the respect of the group. Um, you know, I'm I'm sure you know, especially you being there on the ground, you get to see them operate in in the mixed zones or maybe even a bit of warm ups and practices and things like that. Like, it seems like Jordy and the rest of the coaching staff has gotten the buy in from the players. Um, I see things that are really encouraging. I see guys, first off, guys playing really hard. I was not expecting exhibition games to be so uh, physical so and, competitive. and co- competitive. But like, yeah, they 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 met the challenge, which I really liked. I like that guys are sacrificing. Like, you know, it, it's no small feat to have Dylan Brooks just like literally mostly play defense, right? Like he's not hijacking. He's not taking like crazy shots. I mean, like he'll miss shots because he's not a good shooter, but he's taking shots within the rhythm. He's passing up you know, certain shots as well. I think in in that game when they beat Germany down the stretch, like Dylan was passing up several, I would say like open ish looks that in the NBA context, especially having seen him play the last couple of years with the Grizzlies more, more closely. Yeah. He would definitely would have taken those, you know what I mean? And, and we've gotten that kind of buy-in, I think from the whole group, Um, the way he manages rotations. I mean, it's hard to fully extrapolate based on the exhibition games, but I, to me, there were a little bit too much like bench only lineups. Or not even bench only, but bench heavy lineups. Um, but having said that, though, in the important games, he's been able to close with the starters and they've been able to deliver for him. So I think, yeah, he's won the just respect or of the team and they're responding well to him. One of the cooler things about FIBA, too, is that you get to like just see inside the, the huddle and the timeout. Yeah. So there's just a microphone and a camera like right there. And yeah, you can see how the players are responding to him. In terms of his style, obviously, defensively, it's not like here's 10 things to throw at you like like Nick Nurse, right? Like mm-hmm. we're not seeing no box in one. Like I remember like watching the World Cup in uh 2019 in China and it was like, all right, we're gonna play box in one with like Aaron Best like being your 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 one and everyone else is gonna be in a box and 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 some full court press and some zone and it was like you know, court, you know, minute to minute it was different. Um, I, I think it's been a lot more solid, I think, I w- would say, with Jordy's defense. Um, they've done a, a good job of containing the glass. They don't switch necess- more than I would say they need to. I think, you know, it's not mm-hmm. a good idea to switch so much. I feel like teams are so good at, like, even basic things that you would think should happen in all levels of basketball. Like, you you run a, you know, standard pick and roll with the, with the, the big screening for a guard. 
And then if, if if you switch and you have a guard on their big, then their big immediately goes and seals and then they play through that advantage. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like in the NBA, like that almost is lost in a way. Like that's not a guarantee at all. Or like the guard will be like, oh, I got a big on me. I'll try to ice him. I'm, I'm, like, no, they, they actually play through the size advantages really well, um, especially experienced teams like uh, Spain and Germany. So like I, I feel like not switching as much actually benefits them in this case. Uh, and then, yeah, like, you know, they have Dylan and they have Lou and, and they carry – you know the the burden there defensively but he's been able to get those guys to really buy in um which i mean whatever they're they're dedicated defenders anyway you don't have to get them to buy in so no. much but their role is, is, is i feel like everyone is like fitting a good role it doesn't feel like anyone necessarily is out of position so i mean this being like single game you know tournaments like especially single game knockouts when we get there like that's going to require some creativity at certain points, but I think so far on the broad parts, like Jordy's done a good job. So I have really no complaints about Jordy. What What do you think of kind of like against France? And I don't, we don't need to do a, a huge deep dive, but do you expect there to be like five man bench units or like heavy bench units like there were in, in during the friendlies? Or, or do you think you might alter that a little bit and, and have more of like maybe just a, a rotation of, of of Shea and RJ and maybe Nikhil and just have mostly the NBA players playing all the minutes other than maybe at the five and maybe another wing or something. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting because it's such a hard game and it's the first game of the tournament, right? Like, yeah. I feel like you don't want to necessarily cut your rotation off like first game of the tournament. So I would at least give the first half and, and try out a couple of bench guys like I don't imagine I don't imagine like some of these guys just straight up won't play, but at the same time, like I think yeah, if when it comes down to it, I, I would probably prefer just like an eight man rotation, uh, assuming no foul trouble and everything like that. But uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm not too familiar with the French team. I've, I've watched some of their their warm ups and stuff like that, but I haven't seen too much quality coming off their bench. So yeah. it might be one of those opponents where you can kind of just get away with it in a way. No, yeah, um, no, but. I, 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 I have to say, like the bench has had like really good moments and really bad moments. I would say so far, so it, I would at least give them the first half to see if it's one of those games where they really have it. Because w- there's been times in these exhibition games where the bench has been not stronger than the starters. I would say that's kind of ridiculous, but you know the bench has been solid, and I think that nikhil has been excellent there. Lou obviously coming off the bench; those two really give you some stability. But Kyle Alexander's been reliable. And then there's certain games where, you know, Trey Bell Haynes is like, all right, wow, he, he's he's really like a little spark plug and he's able to get into um, the teeth of the defense. For a small guard, I feel like he's actually done a decent job of getting inside. And then, of course, he's a good three-point shooter as well. So, mm-hmm. and, and with that, like, what out of the obvious, like, players that other than Shea or, or RJ, like, who, who do you think is kind of an X factor for this team if they're going to be successful in this tournament? Yeah, I mean... For me, the X factor really is RJ, especially in a game like France. Like, um, yeah, I mean, like you got Rudy patrolling the paint, and also a guy who's probably pretty familiar with RJ, just you know having the, the two guys play in the NBA. Um, but then you also have big wing defenders that they can throw at him. Like Nick Batum is, you know, pre- still pretty good defensively, uh, especially on the wing. And so RJ is not going to have the size advantage there. And then you also maybe have Garcia Yabusele who can slide over if Canada decides to go small. So, like, it'll be a challenge for RJ, I think, in that matchup. And if he does really well, then I think we actually are in a good spot against France. But, yeah, aside from those two main guys, um, I mean, it, it's kind of got to be Kelly, right? Like, essentially, mm-hmm. like, yeah, if you have all three guys cooking at the same game, you're pretty much going to win the game, um, unless you're playing Team USA. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think you at least need one other guy to show up offensively. And, and Kelly, for me, has just been, like, I mean, I, I'm always happy with Kelly when he plays for Team Canada. I'm mm-hmm. always impressed by what he can do. But I, I think especially if he's able to hold up in stretches at the five, um, which I think Kelly has done that, you know. Um, yeah, I think that's where Canada's, like, fastball really is. Like, again, like, no offense to Dwight Powell, but I'd, I'd, I'd rather, like, take him off the floor, play even faster with another guard on the floor, you either put in Lou uh, if you want more defense and size and physicality, or you can put in Nikhil, who I think is one of Canada's five best players. Uh, and then with Kelly at the five, like you could really space teams out and, and force them to push. So, um, yeah, I, I would say, I guess I would say Kelly. How often do you think they'll they'll play Kelly at the five? Like, is that something that they maybe they ended the game against Germany? And yeah. I thought that was really interesting. <clears throat> they couldn't they couldn't stop Germany, but they could score on every possession. So it was kind of a a yin for yang on that. 
Yeah, I mean, like, especially in a game like France, for example, like, yeah, you put him at five, you bring Rudy out of the paint, like, you know, that might be one of the only ways to kind of attack that if you're not successful sort of with your base, you know, um, strategies. But yeah, I mean, it, it is tricky, obviously, just because, you know, like he, he isn't a five, but at the same time, like, that's one of the ways that you can definitely create an advantage. Um, and that's where you hope that like the rest of the guys are able to come in and rebound. And and for me, I was like, all right, at least your wings and your guards are like pretty big as well. So you can kind of like average out the, the difference. But yeah, Canada would be pretty small with, with Kelly at the five. So I would say um, definitely want to see it at the like for stretches at the end of first halves, for example. Like mm-hmm. I think the last five minutes of the second of the second quarter is, is a really good time to try that out and, and maybe extend your lead and build some momentum going to halftime. Um, and then, yeah, I would probably save that in my back pocket until the fourth quarter again. And again, especially if Canada's down, I would definitely want to see Kelly at the five and, and to, to, to spark the offense. But um, even without that, I think that there are just real advantages that to be gained. Mm-hmm. And and with that, like how, like, do you think a guy like Shea is going to be just run into the ground in a in a in a little bit of ways because of the absence of Jamal Murray, like how much yeah, of an impact yeah. do you think that was just him pulling out? Like I mean, we're a couple of weeks away. Um, how do you feel about it in retrospect now? And and how likely do you think it is that Jamal Murray does play for Canada another time in the near uh, term? I mean, as, I mean, it's so hard to say. I, I think he definitely wants to i think their commitment is there i think there's mm-hmm. opportunity for him to s- sign an extension this uh season with the nuggets and that wasn't really done and so i feel like if he had signed the extension it would have been a little bit easier for him to play but at the same time he's also come on off of injury for like the last two years and was healthy finally and then played the finals and obviously dominated throughout the course of the playoff run so like i totally understand him not coming to play um having said that though i feel like yeah that would like we're talking about like RJ and Kelly Olenek as the second options, like having Jamal Murray as the second option is just, I mean, it's, ch- it's championship caliber really, which we just saw mm-hmm. um, this, this past season. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think in terms of Shay, like the one thing that's good is um, I remember like when I was talking to, to Jonathan about it uh, yeah, a couple of weeks ago and I was like, you know, I suggested to him like, Hey, why don't we just play? Sh- why don't we use Shay? Like we like Slovenia uses Luca and, you know, Jonathan pushed back on the idea. And and I mean, watch the, the the five exhibition games. That's not what's happening here. Like, they're not just giving Shea the ball and getting out of the way, and he's getting like a hundred pick and rolls a game. Um, so I think they're they're kind of picking the spots with him in, in a way. And and it 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 the one thing with Shea too is just he does feel like he's playing on an island a little bit. Yeah, like there's so much of a game that is isolation based. Um, that I'm not really sure how you lessen his workload other than not to give him the ball, but. I mean, at the same time, that is your most effective offense. And it's it's been encouraging to me that, like, he hasn't really shied away from it. Crunch time, he's obviously up to it as well. So, um, you know, obviously they got to manage his workload. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he, his energy looks high. Like, he's even giving great effort defensively as well. He's been disruptive on that end. So A lot of steals. I haven't really seen any drop-offs. Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, he's he, – I mean, what did he, he – I think he averaged, like, 1.7 steals and, like, a block a game yeah. this past season in the NBA. So – I mean, he's used to playing that sort of frenetic, chaotic defense where he's able to use his length and anticipation and stuff. So, do do you think with just going back a little bit to the comparison with him and, and Luca, is it that she's just not as good a playmaker as Luca? So that if he became like in a heliocentric offense, that it's just not as effective as Luca, who can basically pass out of his butt. Yeah, Luca is like a top three passer, like at minimum in 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 the entire world, <laughs> right? So like. <laughs> Um, you know, there was that pass that really went viral. Um, where I think Luca was playing Japan and Did came off the pick and roll, and then went behind his back with the right hand, flipped it over like two defenders and his teammate, perfectly looking into the corner pocket. Like it's ridiculous. That, that 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 I mean, like yeah, Shea doesn't have anything close to that. Um, but I mean, I would also say that like for Shea, like he's his his mentality is different. Like Shea to mm-hmm. me, v- very much feels like a guy that is always and rightfully so always confident that he can beat this guy one-on-one mm-hmm. no matter who the matchup is and so his focus to me is as a scorer um okay. luca's focus to me very much feels like i'm gonna run this pick and roll and i have pretty much every trick in the book and i'm gonna see what you guys do and i'm just gonna adapt my game to that like yeah. yes there are times where luca like 
he's, he's going to score a lot because he has the ball all the time and he has all the ability in the world. But I, I can see when Luca pivots into like a scoring mode, but most of the time he's just reading the defense I dissecting. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's like a different it, style of play. Yeah. It's 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 more like it's just the way he plays is I need the ball. I I like it's more heliocentric and just with Shea, it's more attack and go and like downhill and yeah, no, for sure. Just just with that, like to, to transition a little bit to just like how do you think this team will do in this tournament? They obviously have a really tough draw. That, mm-hmm. as we mentioned, France in the first game. They'll they'll probably play Spain in the second round if if they make it that way. Like how how do you how do you how confident do you feel about this team? What are the chances you think they make the Olympics? Um, just like how do you feel about their their chances at the tournament? Honestly, like it, it's so hard to say just because we're talking about single games. I feel like if we're playing like you know what we would think of as playoff series like that, I think Canada has a really good shot of making it to like you know the finals, quote unquote. But this is not like this is not that right and. So you have you can have a lot of randomness happen in, in single games, right? I mean, you know, the you know the Venezuela game I think is is a classic example of that. So, um, to me, like yes, the path is difficult, but it's not like I can't see a way for Canada to beat France. Like this is not like the 2019 World Cup where it's like, all right, Canada is gonna play Germany today, and like I don't know what we're gonna do against them, or like Canada is gonna play Australia, and I don't know what we're gonna do. like. No, we 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 have other threats to put against them. Like they should be worried about us in the kind of the same way. I would say the only thing that, like, I, I think there's enough talent there to compete with any team in the entire tournament except for Team USA. I think the only thing for me that's missing, and, and maybe this is just, like, a stylistic, like, country, like, stylistic kind of style of play is just, like, you know, when you watch Spain play, when you watch um, Germany play, when you watch, like, Australia play, like, there's just so many, like, backdoor cuts and, like, yeah quick like catch and shoot movements and screening and it's just like they have all the other like um i wouldn't even say easy stuff but they have all the other like teamwork basic stuff down so much to a science that they can rely on that for like 20 points a game no matter how well you're covering them they're just like reading it really well knowing when to cut back door the fundamentals like they, they get 20 points a game off the fundamentals and i feel like canada maybe gets like 10 points a game off the fundamentals and so you need like your actual talent the ability to beat guys one-on-one the ability to make tough shots that has to make up the gap for the other 10 and that's where i'm like if there's any way possible for canada to make that up and that's to me is 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 tough because in the nba you just don't play in that kind of style and so the internationally trained players are going to naturally have more of an edge there but if they were to get that even up more then i think they actually have a definitive advantage over all the other teams but uh yeah i mean I, i think canada has as good of a shot as pretty much any of the other teams like I don't know, man. I mean, like France should feel worried that like they have to probably oh, beat Canada yeah. or, or or Spain along the way, and Spain should be worried about the same thing about France and Canada. So it, it's big talk, but at the same time, like our roster is really good, and you know, even watching the warm up games, I think that's been encouraging to me that they can compete with anybody, you know, and outside of USA for sure. Obviously, USA is uh just just stacked as always. What what do you make of the kind of idea that the more games they play together? the more chemistry they'll they'll get and, and the better they'll play because uh, Jordy actually like I asked him a question today and he said you know I think the later you play us the better we will be so what, what do you think that's a significant factor and and maybe that impacts them in the first game but if they are to to win it and go maybe to the quarters or something that they'll become just live up to the potential of their talent and and be just as much the sums of their own parts yeah I mean I, I think there's some validity in that, of course. I think the thing is, other teams are also getting stronger as the tournament goes on, right? Like, yeah, I think that's just sort of natural. Like, you 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 win some of these games, and you're able to come overcome those challenges, and you learn so much about yourself as a team. Like, I think about the Raptors, for example, when we won in 2019. Like, the team that beat the Magic was a lot worse than the team that beat the the Bucks and the team that beat the Warriors. Like, they got so much stronger as that season one. And I think maybe there's a bit of a comparison to be drawn there just because like that team for the Raptors was also kind of like not newly built, but at the same time you, you trade DeMar for Kawhi, like it changes a lot. And then you trade JV for Marcus all mid season that changes a lot. And so you kind of have to build as the, as the sort of thing goes on. And so I guess that's, just, that maybe is the comparison to Canada in the sense that like, you know, these guys aren't as used to playing with each other, but at the same time, like, I feel like they've already figured out a lot of things like the hierarchy. Again, like, to me, it's just refreshing to watch them come into the game and they know where their priorities are. Like, nobody necessarily is taking shots out of turn. 
defensively, I think they could be more cohesive and that's normal. Yeah. But even offensively, I feel like they already have figured it out in terms of like not only knowing where the shots are supposed to be, but guys respecting where the shots are supposed to be. And so I think that alone is already done. It was already a good reflection of the group and of the coaching staff. So, yeah, I believe Jordy when he says that. But I also think that, again, like other teams are going to build and get stronger as the tournament gets on too. So so if, you know, I had to ask you, you know, like to, to bet your money on it, like does Canada make – the Olympics at the end of this tournament? Um, You know, against better judgment, uh, I would, because <laughs> I feel like there's just, it's so easy to get pessimistic about Canada at the men's team at, at, at the senior level. But yeah, I mean, I, why not? Like, I think this is a really good shot. I think that they have a really good group and, you know, what's also been good is that they've, they've stayed healthy and, you know, knock on wood that they continue to stay healthy. But, you know, this is, as good of a group as we've put together and it's a tough path but it, it's not like an impossible tough path man i mean like we already beat spain on, on in, in the warm-up games and whatever like I, I i think that spain posts like i see them as equivalent challengers just like i see like france as equivalent challengers but yeah i mean you know i don't know i, I think that our roster is really strong so if they lose against france uh i'm gonna get a lot more worried but if they beat yeah. france i'm gonna feel pretty vindicated so what do you think about the idea? That, like I've been saying this on on radio shows and stuff. It's just if they beat France in the first game, they make the quarters and probably make the Olympics. If they lose, then it. it and I don't want to pin it all in one game, but it almost mm-hmm. feels that way in a lot of ways. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is what this is always one of the weird things with the the, the World Cup itself is that like you know I mean when you think about the World Cup, like obviously you're thinking about like this the the the, the, the football like like soccer mm-hmm. World Cup, and it's like all right that's like the be on end all that's like the biggest event in sports like it's like that in the olympics right um and in basketball it's just like yeah the world cup's cool but like everyone's work everyone's trying to get to the olympics you know mm-hmm. and so yeah it is kind of weird in that sense but yeah i mean if canada were, were to place top four you, you, again obviously the goal is to qualify for the olympics and we'll see i mean apparently the dominican republic's been playing great i mean even when they played canada it was pretty solid like i know canada didn't play their starters in the second half but it was it was like a one point game at halftime it wasn't like canada starters were blowing them out and then canada took the starters out and they came back like it wasn't like that at all so um yeah it's gonna be tricky but i mean at the same time like again like i'm I'm just choosing to believe in the the talent like i think what's different between this canada team versus previous ones is that you have so much of your talent coming out and they've looked cohesive through a pretty tough test. I think, you know, uh, bravo to whoever set up the the warm-up tournaments for Canada in the exhibition here, because I feel like yeah. they got real tests along the way. So, yeah, I mean, I hope they don't let us down, but, um, you know, what can you really do other than be a fan and, and try to believe in the country? What do you think it would mean for, for just the game of basketball in Canada if, if the men's team were to make the Olympics and, and probably – going on a deep run like do you think that could have a huge change and ripple effect in this country i mean i yes and no i mean i think like basketball has already become hmm. so like popular in canada and i think you know the raptors have a, a place to play in that i think the overall growth of the game of basketball you know when you think back to like you know even the dream team and and how that sort of made basketball global and that that even like you know um I don't know why I'm plugging Alex's book, but uh, Alex Wong wrote a book prehistoric and and in there, he kind of talked about sort of the ideation of the NBA in terms of like why they wanted to expand internationally. Right. Which was just over here to Canada and and, in Vancouver and and Toronto. But big part of that was like, they saw the global vision uh, and the global appeal that the dream team had in 92. And they were like, let's put a team in Canada. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, like even from that alone, like you, we've seen the growth of basketball just as a sport for the last thirty years. Um, but yeah, when you go honestly, when you 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 can like, I was I was making this observation, um, just like driving around like some of the richer parts of Toronto, like East York, Lee Side, all those and those houses, and you see these like, you know, realist, uh, real, honestly, by Toronto standards, like mansions, you know, palatial estates mm-hmm. with like four or five bathrooms and like three car garages. And like in front of every single one of those kind of houses, you also you already see basketball hoops, and you already know that basketball has um, a strong like you know reputation and um, popularity. I think within probably lower class, like just economically, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, that population. So when you see it at both ends of the spectrum, like you just know it's it's. I don't know. I mean, like I don't know what Canada could really do at this World Cup or even at the Olympics that would make Canada 
love basketball even more, but I feel like everyone in Canada already like is very, very aware of basketball. And yeah, I mean, it'd be great. I think it'd be great. It would bring our reputation up, but I don't do, know. Do you, I think it, we're, we're, we're in a good spot. Do you think it'd be more similar to, uh, I mean, obviously Canada soccer has been a mess since they made the world cup, but almost just sure. like a title shift and just people caring about the the men's team and, and people invested in it like in europe and i hope Spain. so I, I, like even in the u.s as well yeah i mean i hope so. look listen man I mean, the u.s is not going to care about anything other than the u.s man like yeah, let's be honest like no, the u.s no, is so <laughs> large and like they have so much media and produced and it's like they don't need to care about anything else like america is an inward focus and i i don't even blame them like you know yeah. like they're from like the capital of the world essentially um but i think for for canada like i think a couple of things like even even something like sponsorships, for example, like um, I think first off, the just on the business side, um, the Canada basketball has done a great job of getting sponsorships, getting money into the program to to expense things like, you know, getting them chartered flights, getting them, you know, situated insurance. at good hotels, you know, getting them insurance. That's such a big, big part. It's like, we're, I mean, it's not cheap to insure like Shay's max contract. You know what I mean? Like, so. <laughs> You need to you need to have all that sort of in place, and that comes from sponsorships. That, I mean, and also that, that funds more of your grassroots programs, that funds all your other programs that that sort of comes about. Like Canada Basketball is, is a huge organization, you know. Like, um, you know, so yeah, I think on that front they've already kind of expanded well, right? Like they've they've gotten a major TV partner in in, in Sportsnet to to carry the games. Like I remember back in the World Cup. Uh, four years ago we were watching that thing on the zone like yeah. what like you know what <laughs> i mean like and i wouldn't even have the zone if i wasn't a big soccer fan so i was like all right so like we were watching that thing on the zone and um yeah we've just come a long way man like you got an airline you got a grocery store you got a you got a you know car and so i think that like yeah i mean when the program really does well and it hits on that level i think you also bring in more money to just grow the organization and, and i guess the sport of basketball financially as well because I, I don't think that's an incident factor i think like you know, even hearing some of the stories about like, oh, Germany's taking charter flights to to Indonesia from Berlin. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you, mean, you mean if I if I were flying from Germany, or first off, that's a, that's an incredibly long flight. But second of all, yeah. if you're telling me I could just see Dennis Schroeder at the airport, you know, getting a, a smart water, like that's that's wild to me, right? Like, so yeah, I mean, I think that 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 all helps the program. Um, yeah, no, for sure, and uh, I I hope uh, that you get. Dennis Schroeder on your program as as soon as training camp starts because I think that would be a, with with Smart Water maybe have a yeah, Smart yeah. Water as the 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 commercial or something like that on on your show. I think Smart Water is like one of the official waters of uh, I don't know how the contracts are done in in, in Scotiabank Arena, but I mean definitely it's a co think, yeah, yeah, provided think... building, and so there's a lot of Smart Waters in the media room and stuff like that. So I assume that uh, you probably probably could see Dennis drinking some Smart Water if that's what you come to see. But he's a great interview, though. I, I really was not, I, I guess I wasn't so familiar with Dennis's personality, but mm -hmm. he's an interesting guy, and um, I'm rooting for him. He's easy to root for, I think, when he's on your team. Maybe when he's not on your team, you're like, who is this guy, and why is he, you know, talking trash and, 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 yeah. and be beating my guards off the dribble? But um, <laughs> when he's on your side, you're like, all right, this, this guy's kind of sick, so I'm excited for Dennis Schroeder. And so uh, just I'll, I'll ask you one Raptors question before I let you go. Just how, how are you feeling about this team? Obviously, Dennis Schroeder is, is now the the white whale to save uh, oh, the God. team from. <laughs> God, I'm not that excited departure. for Dennis Schroeder, to be clear. <laughs> to be clear, I'm a, reasonably, I'm a reasonable level of being excited for Dennis. But yeah, I mean, what can you really say? Like, look, um, I don't think like object like my rational brain is like, look, they're they're not in a great spot in terms of just like. The roster build isn't really ideal. The spacing really isn't ideal. Uh, I think you lost a skill set that Fred could bring to the team that maybe last year was more lacking at times. Um, mm -hmm. But overall, like I still, we still needed a player of that sort of caliber or of that kind of profile, and we haven't really brought anything to replace him. We have brought in something different in Dennis. Um, so that's my rational brain saying, like, yeah, this team's probably not that good. But at the same time, like. I, I think my emotional brain and I think the, the the attachment that I have to this team, like I've talked myself into teams a lot worse than this version of the Raptors. Like I'm not like a lot, a lot worse than this version of the Raptors. Like I was, you know, I'm like, all right, like, let's go. It's a, the young guns movement with DeMar and, and like Sonny Weems. And uh, like, I, I was, oh I God. love Sonny Weems, man. I thought Sonny yeah, Weems was going to be like the next Rudy Gay or something, or not, you know, and like that, I mean, whatever, I guess we literally upgraded from him to Rudy Gay, but I talked myself into Rudy Gay and DeMar and like, 
all this other kind of stuff. Like I was like, oh wow, we're getting Sean Marion. Like let's go. Like that's gonna work. <laughs> like so. I, I, look for me, the the, the emotional brand is always gonna be like, look, I actually, you know, I, I will. I'm always gonna find a way to to like and enjoy the Raptors, no matter sort of who they're putting out there. And on top of the fact that, like, yeah, there's there is talent, young talent there that you know I am invested in. Like I want to see especially if Darko's going to come in and be a developmental coach. First off, I don't know what he's going to do specifically because he doesn't say anything in his interviews. He's <laughs> so media trained. He gives four answers. I, I think I've, I've, I haven't heard an original thought from Darko just yet, okay. but obviously over the course of the season, we'll see that come out. And of course we'll get to see the product on the court, but like, I want to see, can Precious take that next step? Can Scotty take that next step? You know, what is Grady going to be? Can Christian take that next step? And, you know, Gary, can he expand his game? OG, you know, like, this is kind of the last year for OG where it's like, or listen, bro, if you don't really come in and, like, take that next step and you become a 20-point-per-game score and you have mm-hmm. ability to play off the dribble and you can handle the ball a little bit or even run a couple pick and rolls, like, if this isn't the year for that, then you, you are just, like, premium 3D guy, you know. You know, we're not going to buy into this, like, jump coming up after, after this season. So the opportunity is kind of there for the group. And yeah, I mean, if they find a way to take it, like I wouldn't be too surprised that this team was actually good and above 500, but that again, that, that might be more emotional brain than rational brain. How, how much, like I, th- I feel every Raptors fans has to ask themselves, like how much do they trust Masai now? Because everyone was all yeah. in and, and now it feels, I I just really haven't understood his, his moves the past couple of years from on like a scale of one to 10 of like 10 being, you know, Masai, we trust, you know, June 2019 to, to where you are now or to one, just no trust. Like, where are you at? Will? yeah, I mean, we were really on a high for a while. And, and to be fair, Masai was on a high for a while. Like I think they he, he just did a, such a great job, him and the rest of the front office. Um, I mean, the, the weird thing for me is just like, how does a front office quote unquote fall off? You know what I mean? Like we've had pretty much the same brain trust of like Masai with Bobby as a number two and Dan Tolsman as a number three. We've had that same structure in place for like, well, I guess Jeff Weltman was around back then, but I mean, I don't know like that he moved on, but like we've had it in place for like a 10 years now. Mm -hmm. And I get players dropping out because like they got injured or they got older or, you know, whatever the game changed on them. Like how does a GM fall off? You know what I mean? So (laughs) To me, I'm just like, look, I, I still believe in the ability and and maybe they were on a hot streak and now they're on a colder one. But yeah, to me, I, I think it would also make a lot more sense if he was able to like articulate a, in a more honest and transparent way in terms of what the vision is. Like, I think like Raptor fans, especially in the 10 years since Masai has taken over, the fan base has expanded so much. But at the same time, we're still pretty realistic at the core of it. Mm-hmm. And we can handle if you tell us like, you know, this team is you know, like, look, we're not necessarily in a great place, but we are building on this direction or we are trying to do this or we're trying to make the vision work. Even if you were trying to make Vision 6-9 work, explain that vision and explain and sell to us that vision. And so I just don't think that the, the expectations are clearly communicated. And so everyone's kind of expecting this or expecting that. And when it inevitably isn't those things, then people get really disappointed. And I think that that's why you're seeing such strong reactions to the team. Also, I mean, like they haven't played well, and he personally came out and said things like they're selfish, and also yeah. they didn't enjoy watching the team. I, also, by the way, I mean, like yes, I think that that helps, but like on the whole, like it just it doesn't really bring a great thing because now the whole off season we're just calling guys selfish, and yeah. like I'm not saying that that's not true. Like he he is telling us the truth in that front, but I think we're now applying that to like everything. You mm-hmm. know, it's so mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. Well. Well, Will, thanks so much for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. I just want to give you the floor um, just to plug the Raptor show. Anything coming up, anything fans should should stay tuned for, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I appreciate you. Um, yeah, I mean, just tune into the Raptor show. Like, We'll have coverage of uh, the FIBA World Cup as well. Um, awesome. Unfortunately, I'm going to be away for this upcoming weekend, but I will. I did delay my flight so that I can catch Canada, France, and, and deliver some content. <laughs> wow. there, so okay, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm just going to Chicago. Like, it wasn't like anything crazy okay, in Toronto, okay. but uh, yeah. I mean, no. ultimately, yeah. Like, uh, you know, there will be lots of coverage on on the World Cup. So, um, stay tuned to that. But also at the same time, like, you know, we're we're going to cover every bit of Raptors news. You know, we talked about the Raptors getting sued, which. Uh, yeah, talk about great headlines. I mean, the Raptors getting sued. No, no matter how petty it is, like it's it like is kind of stupid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, so I mean, tune into all that. What do we? I mean, we just recorded an episode yesterday about Canada basketball, but also kind of we did a draft on like, um, 
favorite CNE activities. <laughs> so okay. you know, there's there's all all sorts of lifestyle content. I feel like that awesome. kind of is, you know awesome. become permanent you should, on the show. You should change your like the podcast sometimes when you get Alex on just to lifestyle and sport or something on like yeah, Spotify. Yeah, yeah. that would that would work. It, sports should definitely be second when when alex comes on the show but hey listen it is what it is it's off season like what do you you know like i guess we could talk about canada basketball every every episode but yeah i think there is no, an appetite I, for a little bit more and um yeah i don't know man everyone well, loves uh, the cne right like you you're from Toronto. exactly yeah no yeah, yeah. exactly yeah yeah um well thanks so much lou for for taking up uh, lou oh my god will, will lou for for taking the time and uh coming on and, and sorry for butchering uh, your name just there but uh no, thanks again for for doing this i really appreciate it love the show love your work and uh, it's really cool to, to have you on and uh, uh have a safe flight and uh, i'll definitely be uh, listening and watching to you at the raptor show for the rest of the year and uh yeah thanks again yeah thanks to you too man and uh yeah congrats on being out there like enjoy this experience soak it up collect all the memorabilia that you can um and yeah tell us what's actually happening from the ground i'll definitely do my best and i already have my uh my first uh, FIBA accreditation. So that's definitely going to be hanging up on my wall for, for a long time. So that that's pretty cool. And uh, Arash Madani's just been throwing me everywhere and, and teaching me everything. So I'm, I'm in good hands. So amazing. Yeah. Thank. Anyways, thanks again, Will, and uh, have a great one. All right. Speak soon.